Um, uh, delighted to be here again, uh, so near the Brandenburg Gate. Um, it always brings back memories because I actually came to Berlin on the second night when, of the um, process of the falling of the wall with, um, with an American journalist from Warsaw we drove. She's called Anne Applebaum. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's how it happened. Um, we're meeting uh, the day after Putin launched a barrage of missiles at Ukrainian cities, hitting parks, playgrounds, university buildings, including the Russian Studies Department of uh, Kiev University, a Philharmonic, power stations, and other random targets. Ukraine has previously carried out a successful offensive and some remarkable special operations. The recovery of Ukrainian territory has revealed the ugly truth of the Russian occupation for previous several months. Torture chambers, charred apartment blocks, mass graves among pine trees, which, I mean, the, just the photos make every poll immediately think of the mass graves of our officer corps in Katyn in 1940. After two world wars, such things were not supposed to happen. We were supposed to have learned as Europeans that you don't start wars on the pretext of protecting your compatriots on the territory of a foreign country. We have the Council of Europe and its Convention on the Protection of National Minorities to deal with such issues. Um, if, I mean, we have plenty of such spots in, in, in Europe. We go skiing to what the Germans called South Tyrol and the Italians called Alto Adige, and they used to have wars about it, right? But we've learned to solve such problems. And yet, here we are an old-fashioned invasion by a bigger European nation-state of a smaller neighbor. I'll try to answer the question of how did we get here and what do we do now. And I'm delighted to speak again before the German Council on Foreign Relations. Last time I spoke to you, as, as you mentioned, Rolf, was at the height of the Euro crisis. Now we are at war on the periphery of Europe and allegedly on the possibly conceivably on the brink of nuclear war. Last time, on my return to Poland, uh, I was subjected to a non-confidence vote by the then nationalist opposition, but we defeated with it with an overwhelming majority. I wasn't silenced then, and I'm not going to be silenced now. After all, if I may brag, Foreign Policy magazine named me one of the world's 100 top public intellectuals, quote, for speaking the truth, even when it's undiplomatic. <laughs> and I wear this badge with pride. Our populist propagandists, you may not know, uh, coined a phrase for, for that speech. Um, it's still sometimes referred to as the Berlin homage, even though you might have thought it was pretty, um, pretty provocative. Well, I'll do that again because how do you change minds otherwise? And please forgive me for quoting the key passage uh, 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 to the full, uh, which I know is repetition. But still, this is how I allegedly subjugated Poland to Germany. Quote, what is Poland's foreign minister do I regard as the biggest threat to the security and prosperity of Poland in the last week of November 2011? It's not terrorism, it is, not, it is certainly not German tanks, it is not even Russian missiles, which President Dmitry Medvedev has just threatened to deploy on the EU's border. I was referring to the Kaliningrad exclave. The biggest threat to the security of Poland would be the collapse of the Eurozone. I demand of Germany that, for its own sake and for ours, it help the Eurozone survive and prosper. Nobody else can do it. I will probably be the first foreign minister in history to say this, but here it is. I fear German power less than I'm beginning to fear its inactivity. You have become Europe's indispensable nation. You may not f 
fail to lead, not to dominate, but to lead in reform. Lead in reform. We will get back to the Russian missiles and the German tanks uh, later on, but I could repeat those words today with reference to the war in Ukraine. Instead of leading from the front, Germany is being criticized, not without reason, for again lagging behind others. On a per capita basis, you are providing less assistance to Ukraine than smaller countries with weaker economies. Hopefully, with his attacks on Ukrainian cities, Putin has clarified in everyone's head what this war is about, uh, and um, uh, German policy will be intensified. What does Putin want, and how did we get to where we are with him? Well, he is now the ogre, but let's just remember that Putin did not become today's Putin immediately, although the potential for violence was always there. He started as prime minister with a program of Russia's modernization, which we could have lived with and supported. For some years, he seems to me to have been on a convergence course with the West and was willing to spend political capital for the sake of economic integration with the European Union. After Chancellor Merkel told him that Poland had a veto power over Russia's association agreement with the EU, he actually even tried to fix the Polish-Russian relationship. He came to Gdańsk in 2009 for the anniversary of the breakout of the Second World War. This was not a small thing. He was there by acknowledging the Western um, uh, narrative of the Second World War and departing from the Stalinist one, which claimed that the Second World War started in uh, June, uh, June um, 41. He was actually the first Russian leader on 7th of April 2010 to visit Katyn. First and only one so far. But then, in 2011, when his return to the Kremlin was greeted with mass protests in Moscow and St. Petersburg, he concluded that the West was trying to do to him what we had done to Gaddafi. He decided to create an alternative and rival pole of integration, the Euro-Asiatic Union. Uh, and he correctly concluded that it would not be a serious organization without Ukraine in it. My friend and mentor and the um, patron of this uh, lecture, the former U.S. National Security Advisor, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, used to say that Russia had a choice to be an ally of the West or a vassal of China. Putin has made his choice, and it's already obvious that it's a catastrophic error. Instead of becoming a small China, Russia is fast becoming a large Iran, a rogue state with nukes. The reason he did so is perhaps because the interests of Russia and the interests of her president don't actually align. It would be in Russia's interest to be on a convergence course with the West, to modernize its economy and society as we all hoped Russia would, and to secure its Far East. But the first interest of Putin is to stay in power, come what may. And from this point of view, an alliance of autocracies is more attractive. I knew that Putin was going to invade from July last year, when I read his essay, uh, a rare rant comparable to the Führer's table talk, in which he described Ukraine as an artificial creation not long for, for this world. It was consistent with what he had said at the 2007 Munich Security Conference and the 2008 Bucharest Summit, except that this time he ordered the text to be read by all his professional military. Now, why would you do that? In Central Europe, we actually felt that he was up to no good, 
much earlier, when he had changed Russian school curricula and the media to pump out consistent, hostile, um, imperialist propaganda. In the beginning, there is always the word. It was never about Ukraine's NATO aspirations. We now know that there were negotiations between Ukraine and Russia which resulted in a deal for Ukraine to remain neutral. Besides, remember, Chancellor Scholz, both in private and in public, assured Putin that Ukraine would not be admitted into NATO under his watch. And as you know, it requires unanimity. So Putin received an effective moratorium of perhaps several years. So the so-called realists have to claim that Putin had to go to war because hypothetically uh, Ukraine might apply again in several times. That's not serious. Um, also, um, if a country's NATO aspiration forced Russia to invade, and this is as clear a test of an academic theory as you will ever get. Um, Russia should now be invading Finland and Sweden. Um, but not only is it not doing so, it is actually moving troops and equipment away from the Finnish border to enforce uh, the fight in Ukraine. No. Putin did not invade Ukraine because she aspired to NATO, but because he wants Ukraine. His original war, maze, war aims were most clearly stated in a proclamation on the conquest of Kiev, with Russia's official RIA Novosti agency prematurely released when they thought that the Ukrainian capital was about to fall. Read it. It's a chilling document. His war aim was no less than, and I use the words advisory, advisory uh, on purpose, the final solution of the Ukraine problem. Quote, did someone in the old European capitals, in Paris and Berlin, seriously believe that Moscow would give up Kiev? Vladimir Putin has assumed without a drop of exaggeration a historic responsibility by deciding not to leave the solution of the Ukrainian question to future generations. Russia is restoring its unity. The tragedy of 1991, this terrible catastrophe in our history, its natural dislocation has been overcome. Yes, at a great cost. Yes, through the tragic events of an actual civil war, because now brothers divided by belonging to the Russian and Ukrainian armies are still shooting at each other. But there will be no more Ukraine as anti-Russia." End quote. The plan was to do again what Russia had repeatedly done to Ukraine in the past, both in the 19th century and in the 1930s. Extermination of its elites, Russification of its culture and population, and the subjugation of its resources to Russia's own imperial needs. Ukraine could be permitted as peasant folklore, but not as a free and democratic nation choosing its own destiny and its own allies. So when Putin now talks about Ukraine disarming, recognizing the Anschluss of Crimea and making Russian a second official language, it is, from his point of view, only a stage towards achieving his ultimate goal. What does Ukraine want? As clearly stated by President Zelensky, Ukraine no longer insists on joining NATO, but it is now a candidate to join the European Union. It wants to join it in its internationally recognized borders, while Russia pays for the destruction it has wrought, and those Russian officials and soldiers who ordered or carried out the war, the war crimes should face the consequences. It's clear that both countries' red line, Rhines, don't yet meet at any point, and each still thinks they can win. 
Ukraine thinks that it can win because its cause, the cause is just and its people are fighting like lions for their very existence as a nation. They also think that Russian morale may one day snap like it did on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 when Russian soldiers shot their own officers rather than continue to fight. Putin thinks he can win because he still has the capacity to wreck Ukraine's economy and he, he thinks that we in the West are so degenerate that we will choose to surrender rather than energy economies in the winter. Notwithstanding his nuclear threats, he may also hope that bringing Belarus into the war might tip the balance. What Karl Clausewitz famously said about war, that it is the continuation of politics by other means, works in reverse too. Russia and Ukraine are already negotiating on the battlefield. After failing to capture Kiev and Kharkiv, Putin started to talk about a special op military operation in Donbass. On the other hand, he has announced the annexation of territories which he doesn't control, presumably to legalize the use of Russian conscripts in those territories. However, when he threatens a nuclear response to attack, uh, for attacking Russian territory, and then he himself attacks Zaporozhye, which has been annexed as Russian territory. Um, shouldn't he nuke himself for attacking Russia? <laughs> okay, it was a joke. <laughs> Remember, the simplest way to prevent a nuclear war is for Russia not to start it. Nobody else is threatening it, and nobody else will do it. Likewise, the simplest way to end this war is for Russia to leave Ukraine. The war will stop, stop the moment she does so. It is the rapist who is guilty of rape, not the victim. The best way to help a rape, a rape victim is to come to the victim's assistance not to call on her to negotiate with the attacker. When the victim cries for help, you call the police or give, you, give the victim pepper spray or whack him on the back of the head. If and when he's ready to negotiate, there'll be no shortage of mediators, but there is never a shortage of pocket chamberlains willing to trade other people's freedom for their own peace of mind. I don't think this war will end the way of, this, of the Second World War with the unconditional capitulation of either side. It's more likely to end the traditional way, hopefully the way of the Crimean War in the 19th century or the Russo-Japanese War, which ended in 1905. It would be conceptually simplest if Ukraine just recovered its internationally recognized borders and stopped there. Or the war will end as the Russian uh, participation in World War I ended, which I've already alluded to, when Russian soldiers refused to slaughter or be slaughtered. Either way, the shortest route to peace is to speed up weapons deliveries and economic assistance to Ukraine, to persuade Vladimir Putin that the conquest of Ukraine cannot succeed. Now, where did you, Germany, go wrong? I hope, and from Rolf's words, uh, uh, I conclude that you no longer have to be convinced that you in Germany got it wrong about Putin and Russia. That is not to say that anybody was wrong to try to entice Russia our way. No, that is not the charge. We should always, even now, offer countries to choose a better path. Perhaps you drew the wrong conclusion, the wrong lesson from the West's success in the Cold War. Some of your public intellectuals seem to think that it was, that it was won by Ostpolitik, 
recognition of the DDR, the Helsinki process, the intra-German people-to-people exchanges and dialogue. But they're not so keen to remember that the Soviet Union would not have been so amenable to Ostpolitik without the 300,000 NATO troops defending Germany, without firmness in responding to the deployment of Soviet intermediate missiles in the 1980s, or even perhaps Star Wars. Willy Brandt and Helmut Kohl would not have succeeded without Ronald Reagan, Lech Wałęsa, and John Paul II. The recently departed Mikhail Gorbachev did not allow the unification of Germany and the withdrawal of Soviet troops out of Central Europe out of the goodness of his heart, but because his totalitarian empire collapsed beneath him under the weight of its own internal contradictions. Or perhaps you were mistaught the history of World War II. You understand your fault for the Holocaust and you understand that you got licked in Stalingrad, but you, I think, many only dimly perceive that the majority of the killing was not done in Russia, but on the territories of today's Poland, Belarus, and Ukraine. You know that the Soviet Union lost 20 million citizens during the war, but not that the majority were not Russian. Therefore, if you still feel the need to atone for the crimes of your grandfathers, you should direct your solidarity to the biggest victims. And you should be extra vigilant when the leader of a major nation state justifies conquest on the pretext of protecting compatriots across an international border. This is something we can do together to make that part of the continent between Germany and Russia secure for democracy and rule of law. Hopefully, under a different Russian leadership, Russia may join this effort one day too. So, you forgot that opening to Russia should be accompanied with firmness. You built the Siberian gas pipeline from the Soviet Union uh, back in the 1980s, but at that time, it was the US that was providing the firmness. Uh, uh, after the end of the Cold War, um, it was all carrots and zero sticks. You developed a nice theory of transformation through trade, which belied the reality of getting hooked on cheap Russian gas. You agreed to build first Nord Stream 1 and then, even after the Anschluss of Crimea, Nord Stream 2. We told you that it was a purely geo geopolitical project. I did so publicly as Poland's defense minister in 2006 in the strongest possible terms. Take a look at what the German government's response at that time was. I did it again at the Munich Security Conference addressing Angela Merkel direct, personally, publicly. Successive Polish, Ukrainian, Baltic, and American governments told you that even before the construction of Nord Stream, Russia had more pipeline capacity than gas to export. Ergo, the only purpose of building Nord Stream was to change the route of delivery. To be able to supply you while depriving Central Europe of the transit fees or perhaps cutting it off altogether. In other words, enabling either a blackmail or even uh, the, the capacity to wage war on that territory. Your government's consistent, insincere response was that it was a purely business proposition. Yet, it was backed up with government guarantees by coincidence, decided upon just a few months before Gerhard Schroeder took up his lucrative position at Gazprom. Nobody likes to be taken for a fool, you know. Again, let me stress, nobody is blaming you for wishing to improve relations with Russia. We did so ourselves, and for a while it was pretty successful. 
uh, we established, as Rolf mentioned, um, a visa-free border traffic between the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad and the ad adjacent areas of Poland. Our historians, consciously following in the footsteps of Polish-German reconciliation, tried to establish the facts of common history. Our churches signed a conciliatory appeal, uh, again modeled on the Polish and German bishops. And the Patriarch of Moscow, the same one who now says that this is a war to prevent gay marches in Donbass, uh, was actually the first uh, Patriarch of Moscow ever to visit uh, Warsaw. Least spectacular, uh, less spectacular, but most hopeful were the visits of Russian mayors and local councillors to see the miracle of Polish decentralization and self-government. Let's also remember, no need to rewrite history, that actually, uh, Russia was actually help, quite helpful uh, with our operation in Afghanistan. Um, our equipment was able to uh, much more cheaply go to uh, Kabul and uh, Mazari Sharif and back uh, through Russian territory. NATO was even uh, planning joint exercises. But while we did all that, in Poland, we passed a super law which guaranteed the Polish armed forces 2% of a growing GDP year in, year out, just in case the reset doesn't work. We insisted that NATO write contingency plans for the defense of Poland and the Baltic states. We bought F-16s and modernized the Leopards that Germany gave us. We signed the agreement with the United States on building a missile defense site in Poland so as to give the US a bigger stake in Poland's security. I cannot tell you how frustrating it was to talk to most Germans about security in those days. I will never forget my joint press conference at the conclusion of a very successful uh, meeting of the Weimar Triangle uh, in Weimar with, with Frank Walt, Walter Steinmeier and Lauren Fabius in 2014. This is already after the Anschluss of uh, Crimea. A somewhat unhelpful German journalist directed the last question to me, asking whether Poland still demanded the permanent presence of US troops on its territory. And I answered, yes, two heavy brigades would be within the framework of the NATO-Russia founding act, which has been our policy for years. You should have seen the shocked faces of most of the assembled press corps. I was exposed as a warmonger. And this was after Crimea in the former DDR, in a country which used to have 15 times as many uh, as, as much as we were demanding when you were a frontline state. The reason was, of course, that you didn't consider Poland to be a frontline state because you didn't consider Russia to be a threat. That's why there was not even a squeak of concern here in Berlin either among your politicians or in the press, when Russia deployed nuclear-capable Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad with the range to reach Berlin. I don't want to rub it in, but, but let's just recall the spirit of those times. According to Pew opinion polls, up to one-third of Germans at that time wanted to be in an alliance with Russia against the United States. So, you didn't listen to our warnings and you got it wrong. On Russia, we've been proved right. I don't expect you to apologize for 30 years of patronizing tones. I just expect you to listen to what we say now. <clears throat> and what we say now is that this is hopefully Russia's last colonial war. Think France in Vietnam and Algeria. Britain in Malaya or Cyprus or Portugal in Angola. Think of Donbass as Russia's Ulster, except that Donbass and Crimea actually voted for Ukrainian independence at the time of the breakup of the USSR. 
as late colonial wars go, go, it's going through all the predictable stages. First, denying the separateness of the colony. And you heard Putin um, wax eloquent on that. Um, it's astonishment. What? Our peasants with their funny accents want to be separate, want to have their own separate state? That, that can't possibly be so. Uh, they will never manage it on their own. Then, anger. How dare they? We'll teach them a lesson. And then finally, when enough people have died on both sides, all right, you're not worth the trouble. You can go your own way. And then some kind of equilibrium can be established. The war party in Moscow still thinks that with one last push, they can prevail and bring, bring back control. But what I find interesting and inspiring is that the Russian citizens have already understood and have started talking among themselves uh, about the empire being a millstone around their country's neck. They understand that you can't be a democracy internally if you are a, a, an empire externally. In another year or two and Russia might realize that being the largest territorially state on earth, it has no shortage of land <laughs> in which to develop. I have already spoken of a war against a weaker adversary that Russia had fought and lost, Imperial Japan, in 1904. It was also partly about a naval base, Port Arthur. Russia lost, and what happened? First, riots and strikes, the revolution of 1905. And then, reform. Tsar Nicholas II conceded both internationally and domestically. A constitution was passed, a parliament was formed, a relatively free press was allowed for the first time. If it hadn't been for World War I, Russia might have evolved into more open and maybe even democratic society. <clears throat> what do we do now? What should Germany do? Let me start by saying what I think Germany shouldn't do. First, Germany should not now push for going over to majority voting in the European Affairs Council, even though I conceptually uh, support it in principle. Remember, you and France were the patrons of the Minsk process that was supposed to solve the issue between Russia and Ukraine. It was in breach of the Lisbon Treaty, in which we have pledged ourselves to, to uh, conduct our foreign and defense policy in common. Not two member states freelancing. In common. It was supposed to be agreed in Brussels, that's where we were supposed to thrash out our national differences, and then carried out by the High Representative for Foreign Policy and the President of the Council. But that's not what happened in Minsk. Um, two of you as uh, EU's most populous member states uh, carried the policy on its own initiative largely ignoring the views of the only country which, unlike you, is a neighbor of both Russia and Ukraine, namely Poland, let alone those who are even more alarmed by Putin's trajectory than us, the Baltic states. Well, it was a failure. Ukraine did not recover its internationally recognized borders and Putin was not deterred. But Lukashenko was a star of the European diplomatic scene for a while. <clears throat> the problem is not personal, it is structural. France and Germany both, for the first time in their histories, are surrounded exclusively by friends and allies. But not everybody is so lucky. Your joint policy towards Ukraine and Russia proved that you did not accommodate the concerns of flank countries, of border states, in your calculations. 
And since your joint policy failed, we have no reason to trust your judgment in the immediate future. On the contrary, trust needs to be rebuilt. Remember, double majority voting, as provided for in the current treaties, would mean that France and Germany, plus a couple of very small states, would have veto power, whereas, whereas an alternative coalition, either for or against anything, would be almost impossible to put together. So what others are hearing when you demand going over to majority voting is, we may have failed on Russia-Ukraine, but give us your veto power, and we promise next time we will, we will be more communitaire and more successful. The chances that most member states accept this logic are low. I suggest you do it the other way around. First, rebuild trust and allow institutions to carry out agreed foreign policy. Then let's discuss voting reform. And I think we'll need to be creati creative about how that, what system of voting we should have. Uh, there, are, there are all kinds of uh, system, in, including the one in your Bundesrat. Second, don't rearm uh, on a purely national basis. This is what Germany should not do, okay? And I know, I know, we've been urging you to do this for years, the US has been urging you. And now that you say that you will do it, how can anybody possibly object? Well, you can always count on the leader of our ruling party, whose name has already been uh, mentioned. Mr. Jarosław Kaczynski, who has already said that he doesn't know whether Germany will rearm re against Russia or Poland. <laughs> and while this may seem to look like an unreasonable uh, hyperbole, which it is, I suggest you take this as a warning that there will be other political entrepreneurs in Europe who will indulge in this kind of rhetoric. Um, Henry Kissinger was once said of Germany, too big for Europe, too small for the world. And the too big for Europe is true. You're 25% of Europe's uh, economy. Uh, you may not appreciate how nervous um, uh, other countries are. The father of our independence, Joseph Piłsudski, thought that Russia was a bigger geostrategic problem for Poland than Germany, because when Germany becomes too assertive, we immediately have allies. So even though you have, as far as I can see, completely disarmed yourself, don't underestimate the fear that will be generated when you address the problem with your typically systematic way. But there is a solution to this conundrum, which I'll address in a minute. Third, don't fight for a permanent seat at the uh, UN Security Council. This may seem symbolic and is, and, is in, and is in any case unlikely, but it's important because your previous policy was for the European Union to become a um, to, to, to get a permanent seat. This is a question of teleology, of where do you want to be in a decade or two or three? What is your ultimate objective? Is it a European superpower or is it Germany as a superpower? It can't be both. You need to choose and your role in Europe will be judged in the light of how you choose. What should Poland do? I hope you all appreciate what the people of Poland have done in this emergency. From day one, unprompted by anybody, hundreds of thousands of Polish families have accepted over a million Ukrainian 
refugees into their homes. The Polish government followed with public financial assistance and above all with, far, with arms deliveries. Poland has also announced plans to raise our defense budget to 3% of GDP with planned purchases of tanks, planes, aircraft, batteries, and so on. Putin's capabilities have proven smaller and he's in the process of destroying his army. But, he, but his intent has proven worse than we had thought. For Poland, but Poland will be truly secure only when Ukraine is whole, free, and European. Personally, I believe that after the reception of refugees and the delivery of arms, the best thing that Poland can do for Ukraine would be to solve Poland's issues with the European Union. To return convincingly into compliance with the rule of law, to abide by the judgments of the European Court of Justice, and thereby mend its relations with European institutions. Ukraine needs Poland as it was before, as an icon of a successful transformation and an example to follow on Ukraine's road to Brussels, and also as an influential member of uh, EU councils able to uh, uh, influence the, 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 the membership negotiation process to restore Poland's bona fides as a member of EU's G5, I believe it would be useful for Poland to return to the path of convergence with EU's currency, the euro. What could Poland and Germany do together? And I know it doesn't seem um, likely today because Rolf is of course right that there is a, 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 a an anti-German um, uh, obsession, uh, uh, at least in public media in Poland. First, if you now accept that Putin has broken post-war taboos and needs to be stopped, then we need each other for common defense. Russian nuclear-capable Iskander missiles deployed in the Kaliningrad exclave are an equal threat to Warsaw and Berlin. A system that would combine early warning and tracking radars with anti-missiles placed both near the launch sites and around our population centers could be much more effective than systems developed by each country individually. If you now acknowledge that Russia is a problem, wouldn't you rather deter her 500 kilometers from Berlin than 70? It goes for other systems as well. More than that, Poland, I believe, should become leaders of the EU's defense union. We can't be sure that next time Russia attacks a neighbor, the United States will rally around as decisively as they have done this time. It might have a different president, or it might be otherwise engaged, say, in Asia. The defense of Europe's eastern flank is a burden that should not be borne only by countries poorer than you. Decades of free riding on American protection should not be followed by free riding on Central Europe. If Putin and his methods are a threat to all of Europe, then all of Europe should bear the cost of countering him fairly in proportion to GDP. We need units drawn not from member states, but, from, but composed of volunteers from member states, paid for from the EU budget and under the authority of the Foreign Affairs Council. We would then be deterring Mr. Putin rather than scaring one another. Second, we could work together to help Ukraine transform itself from a beleaguered candidate for EU membership to a desirable future member state. Poland can share with Ukraine its experience of being a candidate country, of transforming its laws and institutions in EU's image. Germany can help to overcome the reluctance of some, inevitably, some net contributor countries to Ukraine's accession, which will be expensive. But remember, 
that Poland's entry proved to be mutually beneficial in the mid, in the mid term. Um, and, and Ukraine can be too. Ukraine has some remarkable assets, huge proportion of um, black soils, a, a surplus in the generation of uh, emissions-free uh, uh, electricity. Um, remember that Ukraine's accession to the EU will statistically lower the average EU GDP per capita, which means that some of Poland's regions will sooner cease to qualify for EU uh, cohesion funds. So we will be bearing some of that cost too, and we are willing to do that. We have a joint interest in our money being spent pur purposefully and honestly in Ukraine. We have a joint interest in, um, in conditionality between, um, between resources and, um, and fighting corruption. Third, energy. We warned you that Nord Stream would be an instrument of blackmail and also a source of corruption. And so it has come to pass, including in Germany. You're, you're, you're only beginning, you're only seeing the, t the tip of the iceberg so far. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad that someone has removed three quarters of this problem in our relations. Successive Polish governments had also proposed the strengthening of the energy union, including joint purchases of gas, the same way we, uh, the European Commission jointly buys uranium, thereby using its power of monopsony, being the largest customer. It means that we get energy security, meaning safety of delivery at a competitive price. Uh, and others are dependent on us rather than vice versa. But in the past, we were answered by persistent attempts to exempt Gazprom and its pipelines from general European rules on access to pipeline capacity. This needs to change. We all have a difficult winter ahead, and I am disappointed that unlike during the pandemic, do you remember at the beginning, they loomed the fight over gas masks, respirators, and vaccines, but we solved it. We have not yet found a joint European solution. Nationalists, wherever they are, are wrong to think that policies of the beggar thy neighbor will benefit them. We need true European solidarity, both to deal with the immediate problem and for the long term. We need to accelerate energy transformation not only to save our climate, but as a matter of national security, we must never again allow a foreign tyrant to blackmail us with access to energy at an affordable price. We must build the pipelines from North Africa. We must build the interconnectors inside Europe, storage facilities. We must revisit the issue of how to safely prospect for gas under our own territory. And we should revisit our attitudes to nuclear power. Let me end by saying that despite many prejudices on both sides, we, Poles and Germans, Poland and Germany, are actually more similar than many people think. It's not just that Poland is catching up in its development and most of our citizens are now middle class, but it helps. In our economic philosophy, we both, Poland and Germany, still believe in making things. There is no technological barrier between our young people. Our statehoods, in their current form, though for very different reasons, are both quite young. I'm stepping into, into dangerous territory here again, and I expect uh, to be um, to, uh, to, to get into trouble, but I'll say it anyway. Um, you were the aggressor in the Second World War. We were the victim. You capitulated. We were technically on the winning side, but in fact, we both lost the Second World War. 
we both had limited sovereignty after it and both recover it fully only with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So for both of us, it was a liberation and not a geopolitical tragedy. We are now faced with a much more dangerous environment in which the security of our nations is again at stake. There are siren voice voices that we should return to the simple, familiar certainties of our nation states. There are also those who, for the crudest reasons of electoral advantage, would like to revive the grievances, the prejudices, and the enmity. I say to them, we have seen this movie before, and we know how it ends. We don't, another, we don't need another tear squeezer. We need, this time, a happy end. But for a happy end to happen, both countries need to renew their vows to Europe not in words only, but perhaps in, in painful deeds to a common Europe. Contrary to what some say in Poland, Europe is not a threat. Contrary to what some say and do in Germany, Europe is not a tool. Europe is the solution. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Sikorsky. Thank you very much, Radek. This was, I think, a very, very impressive speech, and um, I think it will resonate a lot, like your speech, um, I would say, 10 years ago um, here at, at DGAP. Um, as someone who has lived 14 years in Brussels and just returned to Berlin, uh, a lot of what you said um, are words that are honey to my soul, uh, and I think certainly are words that should be listened to by, by all, uh, everyone in Berlin. I think you, you referred to a lot of points, a lot of blind spots of the last 30 years um, that are now central to the debate here in Germany and central to the debate um, certainly in the Berlin bubble and where, it, where there is a debate, um, but I would say a lot of agreement actually on uh, your analysis that there were huge mistakes, um, huge mistakes being made in the last 30 years, be that on, on energy, be that also on the peace dividend and the lack of, uh, of, of German armament. Um, the peace dividend, which by the way has been estimated to be in the order of magnitude of several hundreds of billions, meaning the underspending on defense uh, really uh, was huge uh, sort of economic windfall uh, for for the German uh, the German public purse. So I think there is quite a bit of agreement actually on 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 the last 30 years. Um, I found it very noteworthy um, your point on um, how do we go from here um, on the on the rearmament and uh, the increase in the defense. And you you said about the the you talked about the Polish suspicion, and I can just tell a little story about a debate I had, uh, it was non-public, but it's more than 10 years ago in, in a French Senate uh, where um, we discussed the 2%. And I remember how um, some French senators were talking to them and said, well, do we really want Germany to, to spend 2% on defense? That were French senators 10 years ago. So this is not, not just a Polish suspicion which remains, I guess, but it's a suspicion that, that cuts across, I think, many, many countries, including our close ally, ally France. So, um, so of course, um, uh, I guess I want to want to want to sort of throw two questions, uh, two questions at you, and then then get, get, I mean, and perhaps just throw those questions, then give Natalie the words so that Natalie uh, can can give her reactions. Uh, I, I guess one question is is really about um, you know the the practicality of um, uh, rearmament and at a European level. I mean, your solution is of course a solution that, as an old Brusseler, um, I think everybody likes. Um, everybody in Brussels would like it. Let's have some sort of a European defence capacity uh, under the control of. Um, well, you said the council, which I thought was interesting, the Foreign Affairs Council and not the, um, 
uh, not the uh, commission and the parliament, which I think is already an important decision that you took there um, and the suggestion. So, so, so the question is, what, uh, is that a practical solution? I mean, will we actually be able to do this um, in a reasonable uh, amount of time um, and be, do it in a, in a meaningful way so that it actually adds to defense and isn't just a sort of administrative headache or a, a very complicated headache. So, so is, is it practical or is the other approach that is now being taken, which is basically uh, uh, use the 100 billion that Germany decided to use for rearmament, mostly for increasing the national capacities. Um, so, so you seem to, to have some, some doubts about that. And, and certainly I, I was surprised when the 100 billion uh, announcement came out that the first decision on the 100 billion was to just spend, I think, 35 billion on American fighter jets, um, which was seen in Paris, uh, coming back to Paris again, very much as a message, well, but why, why wasn't that used to at least, at least strengthen European defense industry capacities? So, so, so perhaps on the, on the procurement side, I can see how we, how we can advance. I see it less um, on, the, on, the, on the military um, organizational side. Um, second uh, uh, question is on um, um, on um, uh, on well I wanted to talk also about the support to Ukraine and I think that the, before I come to the question so, so the support of Ukraine you highlighted that um, how important it is um, I, I think there your 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 call for leading from the front um, is a call that, that echoes with a discussion we had a few weeks here, uh, ago here when Germany's defense minister was sitting here um, and we talked exactly about that and she was actually um, uh, suggesting that uh, Germany should, should lead from the front. But of course, um, there is still quite a bit of, of uh, doubt whether uh, enough weapons um, from Germany are being delivered. At least the numbers are not, are not so convincing. So, so my hope would be that um, on the financial side, at least, um, Germany can, can lead from the front uh, towards Ukraine. And I think there is um, the capacity to do so, um, and Ukraine does need uh, financial assistance to a significant extent in the next 12 months, basically, just to prevent the Ukrainian um, economy from, from collapsing. I think this, this is gonna be, uh, gonna be absolutely crucial. So, so, so I, I guess the, perhaps the last, the last question I want to want to ask is about um, the uh, Ukraine. Um, the um, so let me get this this point, um, which I, I oh yes about your assumption, um, which I think is quite crucial for um, the overall setup of your speech. Um, uh, it was just one sentence, but you, you were saying you don't believe that this, this war will end in an unconditional cap capitulation of, of any side. Um, um, and, you know, that's, that's a very important assumption. And I think a lot of the debate um, within Germany is exactly about uh, exactly this question of what is the end game, right? And, if the assumption is that there will be an unconditional capitulation by one side because of, and you, you referred also to the nuclear, uh, nuclear issue um, because of a nuclear um, attack against, against Ukraine, then of course um, the whole um, overall setup uh, and the whole, whole overall strategy shifts. So, so, so I think most people basically um, would would at the moment support your um, most people in the Berlin debate would support your your push for more weapon delivery, more financial delivery to Ukraine. Uh, essentially, thinking this will be um, the way of increasing the negotiating power um, of Ukraine towards Russia, therefore making uh, at some stage. Um, uh, a negotiated solution uh, possible, which is not an unconditional surrender of either side.
But of course, there is those that believe, well, perhaps there will be this massive escalation, and then, and then what? Um, and so, so, so perhaps you can, can say a few words um, on, on that. Um, perhaps my, my very last um, point is, and I think you referred to this um, at the end, um, and that's a more historical point, you said, well, uh, Germany and um, Poland were, were both uh, losers of the Second war, World War and winners uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, which I think is a very important statement. And I think it's something that I don't see uh, referred to often enough, uh, enough in, uh, in, in, in the debates we hear here. I mean, we, we need to, I think, also think a bit more, not about the last 30 years, but about um, the history of Eastern Germany um, and the fact that Eastern Germany over um, several decades, and I can say that because my mom actually had to, my mother had to flee from, from East Germany to the West, um, has been really under, under I would say, um, the Soviet uh, rule in an, in an unruly, uh, in, a, in an unlawful state. And so, so thinking a bit more about this unlawful state and the suppression and the oppression of the citizens of East Germany, I think would also help in the German debate to think more carefully about the risk um, the Soviet and Russian imperialism is actually posing, not just not just to Poland, but but actually to to many other countries, in uh, including our, our own countries. So, so that's perhaps my last uh, thought, and I was very happy that you mentioned this this post-Soviet the Soviet uh, collapse at the end, because I really thought this East German story isn't really talked about enough. I mean, Germany was suffering a lot from from the Soviet victory also in, in that sense because East Germany was so much um, uh, so long for so long under under Soviet well not direct occupation but in the Soviet sphere so th these were my my first reactions to your speech but I do want to hear uh, Natalie um, and um, and then we, uh, we we debate a bit the three of us and of course we want to bring in um, you the audience with questions remarks comments afterwards. Natalie, please. Well, <clears throat> firstly, rather, rather it could be say just how powerful that, that speech was. Um, I mean, I'm not going to get into the bilateral uh, German and German Polish dimension of this. Uh, but given that indeed you did emphasize in such a profound way, um, the European context to all of this um, as an Italian uh, as the probably Italian in the room um, let me uh, say a few words and then ask you really a few questions well first reflection actually it's not a question um, as a non-pole and a non-german as an Italian um, I was also actually I mean for me this experience has been extremely humbling this war has been extremely humbling um, and what I say indeed to my German colleagues, because I think we equally got it very, very wrong, is actually the, 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 you know, the fact that this experience has been so humbling in getting it so wrong is actually extremely empowering. I mean, you know, the empowerment that comes with actually saying, and I can change my mind, I was wrong, is I think, you know, something which, um, really we should not be living as a step backwards, but as a leap forwards. And I, as I say, I say this as, as someone who also comes from a country that in many respects got it even more wrong, or as wrong as, as Germany did. Um, the flip side to this, uh, and I think it also uh, sort of echoes a point that, that Guntram, you were making, is that Whereas it is true that we got it very wrong, uh, it is also true, and it goes to the European solution, um, that so the solution necessarily passes through Europe and in particular through Germany. And so at times when we, and perhaps Poland in particular, goes over the top in that German bashing, I'm just not sure we're doing ourselves any, uh, any favors. My third question, and then I've got a fourth set of reflections which are a little bit more articulate. Third question is, is, is actually very, uh, again, similar to Guntram's question. I mean, I was struck um, when you sort of went through the possible phases of this war and you actually ended up, ended in a, in a surprisingly optimistic way. 
the, the point at which Russia realizes it cannot get what it wants, it will just leave. And, and connecting to the, to the nuclear question, um, I'm just wondering if you can, again, speak a little bit more about that. Um, is that, uh, you know, a realistic or the most plausible scenario, or is there not an equally plausible scenario in which Russia understands that it's lost and it wants everyone else to lose with it? Uh, and how do we handle that? And then the sort of final set of, uh, of reflections are, are really, as I say, reflections about Europe rather than about the war or about uh, Germany and, 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 uh, and Poland. Um, now, I, I think sort of Europe has come, has come through over the last 15 years two very bad crises. And what I mean by bad crises are crises that were bad for European integration, the Eurozone crisis and, and the migration crisis, and one rather good crisis, a bit odd to talk about it in this way, I appreciate, which was the pandemic. And what I mean, of course, by the good crisis is a crisis through which Europe refound its mojo again. And my question is, what kind of crisis for Europe is this war? And you could really see things going in very different directions. Uh, on the one hand, it's very clear that the um, extent uh, and, and extreme, really, uh, of this external threat has been incredibly unifying. And yet, beginning with the Polish-German story, it is also clear that there is real potential for divisions both between member states and the risk of reigniting that nationalist populist wave uh, that had somewhat subsided, I would say, during the pandemic. And the question is, is there a risk, and here obviously I'm also thinking about my own country, but is there a risk of that showing its ugly uh, head once again? Uh, the second aspect goes to defense, actually. Uh, yes, indeed, this is a defense moment for Europe. However, I'm not sure it's a moment for European defense. Uh, as we, beginning with Germany, but not only Germany, uh, spend more and spend now, because the war is now, you actually see European defense fragmentation increasing. And there is indeed a by American and by Korean and by anything we find. Huh? But the point is, why is it that there's not a by European? Well, because that's not available today. And yes, you know, we can debate about how much time we've lost in the past in making, you know, in getting us to the situation in which it isn't. Those European capacities are still in their development phase, but the reality is that you need to rearm today. And so I'm not quite sure how we get out of this. You know, we used to think that increased defense spending could actually be, um, that, the, you know, it, it could actually be the catalyst for greater defense integration. I think we're beginning to see it's going in the different direction. I don't have a good answer as to how to stop it. Equally so operationally. Defense of Europe, well, that's NATO's business. What does European defense do uh, in, in this context? It's not quite sure that we have an answer, a good answer to that, to that question. And it's all very well and good up until we have someone called Joe Biden in the White House, because as we know, what happens, what happens after that? And then finally, on the economic stroke energy front. Again, you could see things going in very different directions, and it kind of loops back to the point I was making about political divisions and populism and all the rest of it. On the one hand, you do see, um, you know, sort of good news out there on the horizon. You know, we, it is remarkable how over the course of seven months, we've gone from 40% dependence to well under 10%. Uh, and here we are, and we're not dead, um, you know, so th there is something to be said about the fact that we did actually uh, react. I think it's also fair to say that uh, although at EU level, as we know, there are no energy competences, but actually we've done a fairly good job in coordinating our storage levels, and let's see whether we actually deliver in terms of coordinating demand uh, reduction. So you see elements of, of kind of good news. You also, though, see elements going in the completely opposite direction. And this goes back to Germany. Now, of course, 
uh, I guess you go and Trump, but many of you will say, well, what's wrong with our spending plan? Hasn't everyone else spent uh, on trying to meet uh, the needs of families in need? Yes, that's true. Everyone else has spent, but you spend a lot more. <laughs> uh, and when you, on the one hand, uh, have a, a massive spending plan, and on the other, a resistance to a price cap, which actually translated is a spending plan, the risk is that of reigniting those poisonous divisions that tore us apart during the Eurozone crisis, which is why there is a loop back from this energy story, economic and energy story, back to the political one. <clears throat> uh, let me start with the purchase of F-35s, right? I have a theory about it. <clears throat> My sense of humor will probably get me into trouble again, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'll tell you anyway. When we were confirming um, Ursula von der Leyen as uh, Commission President, uh, I sit with EPP, my party, obviously, and I have a, an amusing German colleague who said, um, look, that's our defense minister. She has more children than the Luftwaffe have serv serviceable aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you have a very urgent need for the aircraft. <laughs> I'm told that the problem is not just that you don't have the um, systems, that you have allowed the production lines of your uh, defense systems to uh, um, to um, go into obeisance. You need to rebuild the production lines. And that means a, a, a decade-long effort. Uh, on most systems, even if you have a production line, from procurement to uh, a, a trained ability to deploy it is usually a decade. So um, if we want to be more secure in a decade's time, we need to act now. Now, on Europe, uh, European defense, I agree, it's very, very difficult. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, of whom I'm a, a big fan, um, devoted to European defense a big, ch big chunk of her State of the Union speech last year. And she didn't commit, she formulated it in the form of questions to member states. Basically, are you really serious about this? And the, uh, the non-response she received meant they were not serious, because they aren't. Um, European defense is uh, talked about, but you need to follow the money. Defense is very expensive. We have created the European defense budget, but it is 7 billion euros for the whole continent for seven years. In other words, 1 billion per annum for the whole continent, it's nothing. I mean, it's, it'll be spent on useful things like military mobility, strengthening some bridges and so on. You can't fight a war for that, with that. Um, and there are, of course, uh, constitutional problems, including in Germany, about serving in another army. But it's actually a constitutional issue per se, because it's the core of national uh, sovereignty. Um, um, but, but the danger of doing it on a national basis, I think, trump the difficulties. I don't believe in a European army, in a joining up of national forces. That will never happen. Um, but we are a confederation with some federal features. When the Americans were a confederation, and they fought the British, they didn't join up the state militias. They, cre they created something new called the Continental Ar Army. And so this is what I believe should happen. We should create new capabilities. You know, we promised to, to create this already 25 years ago. Do you remember after the Balkan Wars, when 200,000 people had to die before, the, before Clinton intervened and saved the Balkans? from itself. We, we were talking then about the you know, rapid reaction force of 30, 40,000 people. None of it came to pass. So 
I'm very frustrated because Europe is not serious about defense, but it should be. If Putin is not a sufficient wake-up call, nothing will be. And remember, there are emergencies in which the United States will not help us, like you know, if B Libya blows again or Algeria blows. Um, we can't count on the United States, and that, nor, nor should we. And we should not be helpless. So, sorry, can I ask you on that point? I mean, uh, I, I see that, and I, I, I think it's a nice vision, but I don't see how it solves the problem of um, national rearmament. I mean, you said yourself that Germany now needs to rearm and needs to buy these F-35 because it needs them now, but at the same time you say this is, this is creating suspicion elsewhere. The solution for that is not to create, uh, let's say, a rapid, a rapid intervention force at the EU level. So, I mean, so there, there seems to be a contradiction here in terms, or is it just sort of a medium-term promise to gradually transform the national capabilities into European ones? Or, or how do you see that, that issue? I think this is really the core question to me. If you spend some of the 100 billion uh, and spend some political capital on creating a, a, a serious pan-European force that could do some actual job, then everybody would be reassured that, that you mean it uh, when you say uh, European Germany. And if you spend it only on Germany, then we, we only rely on the NATO structure, which is good, which at the moment is, is of course, uh, um, uh, necessary and irreplaceable, but I'm thinking a decade ahead. Uh, um, um, at the moment, if the division of labor is that the U.S. supports, uh, uh, sends most of the weapons and Europe sends most of the money, that's not a bad division of labor on Ukraine. Could, it because, it but it should happen. Exactly. Um, because wars, unlike battles, are not won by tactics, I, they are usually won by economics. And whose economy collapses deeper you know, will be important. And at the moment, Ukraine's economy is collapsing faster than the Russian economy for a very obvious reason. It, the, the war is in Ukraine and not in Russia. So we, we as Europe can, uh, can help that. On the end game, Putin is not Nicholas II. Nicholas II may have been a, 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 an autocrat, but he was a legitimate ruler of Russia. The trouble with Putin we have is that he has lied to us so many times that he's completely non-credible. Would you trust the future of your country to the words or the signature of this man? If you were a Ukrainian, you wouldn't. So we can't be surprised. So we have this very tricky situation in which um, the replacement of Putin is a possible side effect of, of the war, but also a precondition for peace. It's actually very difficult to see uh, how you make a deal with Putin. Difficult. On the nuclear issue, I'm told that it's not e as easy as uh, to fight a nuclear war is not as easy as some people think. First of all, um, put aside the intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles. We're talking only about um, the battlefield stuff. The warheads are actually in storage facilities deep inside Russia. We monitor them very closely. We would have, I'm told, five to seven days uh, notice if they were being brought out. So that gives some scope for uh, very uh, big diplomatic effort. Uh, secondly, um, the use of tactical nukes th goes through the normal army chain of command. It's not a button, you have to give an order to the defense minister, the general uh, staff, down to the divisional commanders, and they put the warheads into these uh, artillery shells or, uh, and so on. Um, so all those people along the line would have to be willing to, uh, to uh, obey such an order. 
So all of them would have to, to make the calculation, do I become a genocidal war criminal, or do I resist this order, or do I take out the order giver? Thirdly, Putin doesn't have an army that is capable of operating in a nuclear war environment. Um, these shells are launched at 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers. Prevailing winds are from west to east, so rather towards Russian forces. A two or three kiloton warhead takes out about five square kilometers, so about a battalion. At the, on the battlefield, the Ukrainians are not going to give the Russians very nice, compact targets. So you would have to use not one or two, you would have to use dozens of them. Some of them, I mean, we see what happens to some of the Russian missiles. They, they you know, they self-destruct or explode at launch. That's not a nice prospect for the Russians. They would at the very least have to move their forces away from the adversary. But the adversary would notice that and, and, and go after them. Um, difficult, to, it, it, it wouldn't be the kind of trump card that would immediately resolve the, uh, the war on Putin's uh, favorable terms. I think giving such an order would also be the moment of the greatest vulnerability for Putin personally. Because I don't think the generals are happy with this war and I'm not sure they want to go to The Hague for him. Um, on the history, um, I will, th this is a whole different subject, okay? I, in, in, in Germany, find it surprising when you tell Germans that you were also partly a, a communist state, you know, you're also partly a post-communist country. <laughs> um, um, we, you know, the, I had this uh, um, exchange for years with Frank Walter Steinmeier about what this is, because we work through parallels and historical analogies. You know, I was arguing this is the 1930s, we are, we are uh, appeasing a dictator. He thought it was World War I. We mustn't uh, overreact and cause a, a, a conflagration nobody really wanted. Um, um, so you are not taught about the history of Eastern Europe enough. We are not taught enough about World War I. Because you see, in Poland, we think World War I was rather good because it gave us independence. Mm. <laughs> Whereas in the West, disaster, right? But that's another issue. I think I addressed Natalie's point about a nuclear scenario. So one more thing to say there. So, if we noticed the, the Russians taking out their nukes from storage, I believe that would be the moment for China to, to, to say to Putin what they did in January. Do you remember there was a, there was a Russian foray into, military foray into Kazakhstan to help Tokayev? And I'm told the, 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 they withdrew within a week because China told them, get out or else, or we'll break all trade relations with you. So the Chinese, I mean, the, Russia is now a vassal. The Chinese, I think, have the power to tell, to, 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 to tell them no. And I would count on China to, to be responsible in such a situation. Is this a so-called good crisis? Yeah, well, we don't know. It depends on how we react and, and, whether, we, and whether we win and Ukraine wins, um, uh, but lessons do need to be drawn. I know one thing for sure, that is that if, if we have a change of power in Poland um, next year, and of course I pray that we do, um, Poland will, will end this two-front war with Russia and Germany at the same time. Uh, I have publicly told uh, Mr. Kaczynski, as his former defense minister, that fighting a two-front war, uh, particularly with your allies, uh, is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. 
Yeah, w w wonderful. I mean, uh, j just one quick point on the Chinese vassal state uh, point, which I think is a very important one. I mean, the, the, the funny thing is that um, China actually has also massively reduced its exports to Russia. So it's not that it's not that sort of China has just sort of replaced um, uh, Europe um, uh, in the sanction regime. China itself actually has reduced its support of, of, of Russia. So, so I think Russia is really in a very, very bad state at the moment, um, and, and Putin's policy have been a complete disaster for, for Russia. Um, one quick point on the 200 uh, billion, um, since you, you referred to, uh, to, to, uh, to Germany, and it's of course a story that I know for a long time from, from my Brussels Italian French uh, um, debates on the Eurozone. I mean, it seems to me that, I mean, first of all, the, the number is very big um, because, um, of course, uh, our finance minister wants to respect uh, the, the debt break next year, and so he preemptively borrows a lot of money so that next year he doesn't have to borrow. And how much is going to be used, that's still to be, to be seen. I think that's, that's one point. Having said that, it is a big amount of money. It is actually the largest um, support program uh, in, percent of, in percent of GDP at this stage um, in, the, in the EU. Um, and, um, and of course, um, it raises, as you said, a lot of nervousness. Um, I believe um, yesterday there was a news on Bloomberg that the German Chancellor actually did mention um, that uh, he would be open for some 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 joint exactly so would be open for some joint joint borrowing or something of that sort um, to be to be used as grants and Italian spreads immediately immediately came down and and of course I mean like in the pandemic um, there's always this issue on the one end. Um, I think the, re the rest of Europe wants Germany to stabilize its economy. It, it's really important that Germany does so during the pandemic. It was the same. It helps the rest of Europe. Um, but if it does too much, it creates distortions in the single market. And so, so this, just as an aside, at some stage, we, as, as the program becomes too large and the spending becomes too large relative to what others do, I think there is a case for... Um, you know, joint joint borrowing or joint action um, to stabilize markets. Just to make that that point very quickly, which is a bit beyond outside of this this discussion. Okay, I think we have a bit of time for questions for um, Radek and, and and Natalie. Who wants to ask a question? So so I'm t starting here. One, two, three. Can we get the mic? Oh, the mic is here. Okay, wonderful. Please. Thank you so much, uh, Aunt Freitag Loringhofen. Uh, Radek, wonderful speech, very thought provoking as well. Um, I have a question about trust in, in Germany, which uh, you mentioned a few times in, in your speech. When at the time of re reunification, Helmut Kohl wanted to be a good European as well and pushed for monetary union and political union even in, in Europe, how much has the belief in Germany's Europeanness um, eroded um, uh, since then from a Polish point of view, and I would also be interested from an Ital Italian point of view. Let's, let's collect if you uh, have on shelf. So, so can we get a mic here? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, for this brilliant analysis. I would like to ask you specific, specifically on your view on the future of Russia after a possible end of the war with, with Ukraine. You referred to the historical example of the Russian-Japanese war of 1905 with a stalemate, but then um, 1905 you had Minister, Prime Minister Stolypin modernizing and stabilizing Russia. Where do you see a stabilizing factor like a Stolypin of today in Russia after a possible end of the war? We, we have to take into account that the last three presidents of Russia, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and Putin, now failed with the modernization. Thank you. Uh, Klaus Wittmann, uh, 
Mr. Minister, I was a witness of your uh, Alliance Forum speech 11 years ago, which I have kept quoting ever since. Uh, I have two quick questions. The Weimar Triangle you mentioned in a kind of frustrated tone. Uh, could it have a role in what you advocated as Polish-German leadership of the European Defense Union? And uh, the other question on support uh, for Ukraine. You will agree that besides artillery and air defense, Ukraine needs APCs and battle tanks. In, on the day of the open door of the government, I had the chance to um, say to Chancellor Scholz, the leadership you promised should not consist in constantly pointing to others who do not deliver this or that either, but <clears throat> in German initiatives. For instance, in the Rammstein format, saying we would be ready to deliver tanks and APCs if others follow suit. Now, the question, uh, have you heard of this ECFR initiative of a kind of a European consortium uh, where they say uh, 30 NATO members have about 2,000 uh, battle tanks leopard and they could get together and, uh, and divide the burden and uh, do it together and then not have uh, what the Chancellor fears so much, Deutsche Alleingänge, Germany going it alone. Okay, let's, let's take those three and perhaps you start, Radek, and then Natalie, there was also one question for you. Sure. Um, Helmut Kohl was, of course, a good European, but there is a blemish there. Sorry. Oh. Um, when um, Germany... Uh, the, the old Federal Republic and Communist Poland signed the uh, border treaty in 1971, whenever it was, uh, it was said that the final recognition of the border would be done uh, in, the, um, in the eventual treaty. And, um, and Helmut Kohl was somewhat reluctant to, to put it in the uh, 4 plus 2, uh, and only when he went to uh, Washington, the issue wasn't discussed with President Bush. Um, a journalist asked President Bush, and, um, and, and there was, we perceived it as reluctance as, and as pandering to the um, expertise unions at that time. So this question, which should have been, which we thought was resolved, suddenly became an issue. And an American journalist asked President Bush, so what about the Polish-German border? And Bush, having not discussed it with Kohl, said, oh, that's all settled, that's a done deal. And Kohl had no uh, option but to uh, admit. But that was regarded as, as, um, as troubling in Poland. So he, he's not perceived uh, quite the way you'd like it to perceive him. Um, um, you now have one pipeline for gas with Germany, one that works. We have one that works. And there is one um, uh, from Ukraine via Slovakia and the Czech Republic, the old Brotherhood pipeline. We need, I, I think what would restore trust once the war is over and once we have a new uh, once we, re under a new government, we resume some kind of relations with Russia, would be to have an energy union in which everybody's interests this time uh, are uh, respected, r rather than uh, um, do it it selfishly. That, that, I th that, was the pr that was the biggest problem in Polish-German relations, the Nord, the, the Nord Stream issue. And I think we now have a much better basis on which to, uh, to resolve it. Um, uh, Russia will be much diminished as a result of this war. Uh, Russia had, the business model of Russia was to export oil and gas uh, and weaponry. Would you now buy Russian weaponry? So they've destroyed the, uh, the uh, defense um, 
uh, industry, the, the capability to export, and they are in the process of destroying the, the oil and gas industry. Um, uh, so whatever happens, Russia will go through a period of uh, uh, economic difficulties and will be a much diminished country as a, re as a result of Putin's uh, irresponsible um, uh, behavior. Um, but modernization in, in Russia only happened after the lost war. It's not just the Russo-Japanese war. Before that, when Russia lost the Crimean war, there was a, a reform process under which they, uh, they eventually abolished serfdom. When Russia lost the Battle of Tannenberg in World War I, that eventually produced the, the February Revolution, which was actually somewhat hopeful in the um, in the, the first and only democratic elections then, uh, the, the largest uh, party was, I think, the cadets, the constitutional democrats. Good. Um, and, and as I said, there is an interesting debate among Russian democrats now about shedding the empire and, and, and concentrating on Russia's internal development. It's really tragic. I once did a calculation, a very simple one. What, of what would be Russia's GDP today if she had uh, developed from 1913 onwards at the pace of a comparable northern resource-rich country, Canada. Hmm. Russia today would have the economy of the United States. Instead, it has the economy of Italy and dropping. So, I mean, there you are, but event, you know, hopefully the, uh, it, the trouble is that you know, every country has some proportion of liberally minded people and, and rule of law kind of oriented people. It's just that in Russia the proportions are never high enough. You know? And so one wants to be helpful, but one knows that the chances are not high. Um, but I... Uh, but the in Indians have a saying, or at least I heard the saying from an Indian, that countries reform themselves only when it's almost too late. <laughs> okay, maybe, inshallah. We should certainly encourage them because um, a, a, a Russian government that that started the job of shedding the empire and modernizing Russia and, and, and perhaps economic integration with the, with the West. I would rather have um, Russia as a, re, as, a, as a country in rehabilitation, but, but re, returning to the convergence course with the West than a... Um, a, uh, uh, a member of the autocrats alliance um, seething with resentment against the West. Yeah. Out of very selfish Polish reasons, I'd rather Poland be securely in the center rather than be on the front line. Being on the front line means you sometimes become the battlefield, not, not good. Um, and also if Russia had a change of leadership, um, it would probably mean that the next day there would be a change of leadership in Belarus, which is important, because actually Belarus would be much easier to reform and digest and, and Europeanize than Russia. Um, uh, yes, I was speaking here of the Polish-German partnership be because it seems so unlikely now given the the, the level of rhetoric uh, in, in Warsaw, but yes, ideally, Weimar Triangle should be um, uh, the motor of that. And, and, and that's one ray of hope, actually. Uh, there was a, a, a meeting of foreign ministers a couple of months ago. Um, so, so under the radar, um, the, the current Polish foreign minister seems to want to keep that channel uh, working and, 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 and perhaps uh, uh, planting the seeds of something, something good for the future. Because yes, the French have been keen, at least in, in words, 
on uh, Europe, the puissance, you know, and even talking about the nuclear deterrent and so on. And, and they have experience of creating expeditionary forces. Um, I mean, this, this, could be a, this could be a good thing, but it would need Germany to really and truly choose a European future also in that area. Um, you know, combining the, 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 the great power attributes of Germany, the, the, the economy, with the great power attributes of France, namely the, the nuclear deterrent and the, and the permanent seat. Um, uh, you know, President Macron has been appealing to Germany to, uh, to agree to such a deal for some years, um, to no avail hitherto. Um, um, Russian massacres in Ukraine are uh, reminiscent to us of Katyn, but Russian bombings of Ukrainian cities should be evoking for you the uh, associations with the bombing of London, Dresden, Hamburg, uh, and, and, and German cities. And we know that A, it doesn't work. Uh, it produces the opposite effect. It galvanizes the nation. And B, um, that Ukraine really, really needs anti-aircraft weapons. And you, could, you now have the perfect argument for the German public that anti-aircraft weapons are a defensive piece of equipment. This is to protect population centers from these, uh, from these, these terror attacks by the Russians. So this is a moment to do it. Um, and I think a, a, a consortium on, on tanks would be, is a very good idea. I mean, there have been halting attempts and, uh, you know, Poland had its, pro, its, its, its public spat with the United States on the MiG-29s and a public spat with Germany on the Leopards. But, you know, some grown-ups need to meet in a room and, um, and decide how to share out the... The, the burden and the work, because some of these tanks need to be uh, modernized, uh, you know, Ukrainians need to, be, need to be trained and so on. We, we have too many tank types, you know, and it and looks like we'll have even more in Europe, which is, um, but, uh, but this is, this is a, 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 an idea that I would wholeheartedly support. Wonderful. Um, uh, we, uh, perhaps we get one or two more questions and then you get the last word, uh, Andradik. So there's one question there. Um, is there another question here on the left side? Raise your hand. Uh, Orisa Lutsevich with Chatham House Around Ukraine Forum. It, it's a pleasure to be at this inaugural event, especially Radek giving such a, um, you know, it's inspiring but also disturbing speech about thinking how we're replicate mistakes and as I was wa wa walking yesterday by Han Aron streets and thinking about did we really understand the nature of that evil and why is it repeating today in the 21st century uh, I'm thinking that perhaps something you Radek didn't mention and I wonder if you think it's important is that um, what Alexandra Matvichuk the Nobel Prize winner said in her inaugural speech that we have the circle of violence replicating itself because you know, the Second World War has never really finished by condemning horrible violence that were committed by Stalin. And instead of saying never again, Putin says, I can repeat again. So for that future, when we're contemplating the end game and future of Russia, for Russia to have a future, it has to condemn, apologize, stand on its knees in front of Ukrainians and say, we did wrong. And I think here, German experience in, again, restarting that conversation on how to do it right or how to do it wrong, but this has to happen. And I think until that happens, there will be no peace on the European continent. You know, and, and just a hypothetical question, if Brzezinski were today in, in, um, in, in Washington advising Obama, there's a feeling in Ukraine that U.S. is providing enough just to stall Russian, uh, Russians in Ukraine, but not to really prevail on the battlefield. Would Brzezinski approve some strategy to exhaust Russia, to exactly push in that reform uh, trajectory, but not to do it too fast? Thank you. Okay, is there any other question? Um, yes, please. And, th and then um, we have the last word. We have to stop sharp it, please. 
Thank you. I'm Hanna Malhamaki from Finnish newspaper Helsingin Sanomat. I would like to ask Mr. Sikorski, how obvious do you see the possibility of uh, change of thinking about Europe in Poland? Because we know Peace Party and we know that um, this time it's actually increasing the nat nationalistic thinking everywhere in Europe actually is kind of increasing. How probable is it to raise that modern new wave of European thinking that you said would be needed. Thank you. Okay, so I give Natalie perhaps you the word and then... Uh, very, very, very briefly, um, just two, two thoughts. I mean, the first actually going back to, to this discussion of, you know, we could talk about it in terms of both defense and energy, you know, how do you walk and chew gum at the same time? How do you uh, spend more on defense, which inevitably means, you know, spending on non-European while at the same time fostering uh, defense integration, which actually I think echoes uh, another question which has to do with energy. How do you both ensure energy security without forgetting the energy transition? Well, the answer to both questions is more money, mm? a lot more money, yeah? because you need to do both at the same time. Um, and, and this goes back to the German, to the German question, uh, because you know, like it or not, the truth is that there are some member states that have greater fiscal capacity than, than others. Uh, and if we are to talk about a European solution, we can't escape that, uh, which is why, you know, sort of going to the, to the trust question, um, which is why on the one hand, and, and, you know, I've been saying it a lot in Italy, actually, you know, Germany does have good arguments. You know, why is it that we're not talking enough about demand reduction? Why is it that we're not talking about uh, enough about, you know, fiscal discipline? You know, why is it that we didn't, you know, get so uh, shocked when not only has Spain been subsidizing its bills for months now, but its demand, you know, its demand has actually increased to 120% year on year. And yet when Germany does it, hey, shock. You know, so I've been making these arguments back at home, but I think there needs to be a recognition in Germany, which I think there isn't enough of, that given that the only solution to this thing, these things is more money, it, there is not a route <laughs> that bypasses Berlin. You should not be thinking that the West doesn't want you to win. This is not true. Um, what the West, the, the collective West wants is for Ukraine to succeed, but without sparking off a, a world war, a direct clash between the West and Russia. And that's a legitimate um, strategy. Uh, because of the nuclear um, aspect, the best way for you to win would be for the Russian army to, um, to collapse and go home. Um, because that, um, well, for obvious reasons. Um, I agree with you that uh, Russia, uh, not just Russian elites, but Russian people need to be de-radicalized de once this is over. You know, there are various theories about uh, why uh, Versailles didn't work and why we had a second uh, round with Germany in the 20th century, starting with Keynes, you know, economic uh, consequences of the peace. But very few people talk about the fact that actually in the Versailles Treaty, it says that the Kaiser was supposed to be put on trial for war crimes, for the crime of aggression. Instead, he escaped to Holland and lived out his days calling on, uh, on Germany to use gas against Jews. Um, we failed there. We failed to, 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 um, to symbolically condemn the perpetrator of aggression. And of course, in Russia's case, it's, it's doubly difficult because, as I said in my speech, I don't expect the, this war to end with capitulation of Russia. So the Russians would have to do it themselves. Um, but, but, uh, but in any kind of resumption of relations, we need to insist on this. The, 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 the school curricula and the media and the, and the, um, 
those horrible um, purveyors of hatred of Rus on Russian TV, those people need to uh, pay the, uh, bear the consequences of what they've done. You know, I, I like to say that you know, Julius Streicher, the editor of Der Sturmer, never killed anybody, but still he, got, he still got the death penalty in, in, the, in Nuremberg, as did Ribbentrop, by the way. Um, uh, and, and that taught everyone a lesson for a while. Uh, uh, and, and this, this needs, to, needs, needs to be done again. We don't know how. But, you know, Milosevic, Karadzic, when they were perpetrating their war crimes, they never thought that Serbia would hand them over to an international tribunal. And yet it happened eventually, when Serbia wanted to burnish its credentials of, of being a different kind of country. And hopefully it will happen with Russia too. Thank you so much, uh, Radek Sikorsky, for this wonderful speech and the wonderful discussion. Thank you to you, our audience, for having been here. Um, this ends the public part of the event, but there is, and I'm uh, asked to tell you all, all there is still a non-public part of the event uh, taking place here in our, our, off, in our event space. So you're, of course, invited uh, to stay on. It, it will continue under Chatham House rules, but now we have a uh, uh, a coffee break for 30 minutes and thank you so much.